Uh, this is very, very frightening. I just wanted to show you this, if they will, if I can get um, this browser to cooperate. Uh, a case of bubonic plague is reported in northern China's inner Mongolia. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> a third-level warning alert was issued on Sunday by the Bionair, Bionier, I don't know, Health Commission after a hospital in northern China's inner Mongolia reported one suspected case of bubonic plague on Saturday. The Health Commission urged people in the city to take precautions. Uh, according to the BBC, uh, while plague is one of the deadliest diseases in human history, it can now be easily treated with antibiotics. Did you know that? Did you know? Um, but, you know, nobody likes to hear the word the, the words bubonic plague. You know, historically, th those are bad words to hear together, bubonic and plague. And this is not good. And I'm wondering if actually this is... <clears throat> Again, connected to the melting of permafrost in the Arctic, uh, the changing of climate, the rapid change in our climate, and how you know diseases might mutate or become more prevalent or reanimate, uh, I guess you, if you will. Uh, and because of climate change and because of the changes that are most certainly happening in everybody's physiology, uh, right? Everybody's bodies are probably changing or not changing fast enough uh, in response to climate change. So how your body reacts to these reanimated or newly mutated or different or more virulent strains of diseases is probably very crucial. Um, just, I, and I'm just totally you know, spitballing here. This is not based on any kind of concrete studies or science or anything, but, you know, in, in the back of my mind, I wonder, because of the rapid escalation of climate change, uh, you know, we're going to run into all kinds of different phenomena happening more quickly than we can respond to, right? Disease mutations, virus mutations, um, you know, common diseases, cold, cold and flu, mutating into much more uh, active and maybe dangerous strains, and, and our bodies not being able to respond to them. Uh, a lot of, uh, I see there's a discussion about Guy McPherson in the uh, chats but I'll leave you guys to that. Uh, moving on. So the other day, I asked a question around how th hot people thought it was currently. Um, I don't know why Arctic News is looking so weird. I wonder if there are... I don't know if it's me or if it's the page. I'm trying to get this to reload a little bit here. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Or maybe not. Anyways, this is how it looks. Uh, temperatures rise from, uh, temperature rise from 1750 to 2016. Calculating the temperature rise from 1750 to 2016. So, I'm not sure. I feel like this is an older post. Um, again, you know, Arctic blog is kind of famous for predicting <clears throat> very rapid rises in temperature. <clears throat> uh, but this is kind of, you know, the cycle over the last 400,000 years of temperature, carbon dioxide, and methane. And the thing that is really hard to see in that in this graph is that <clears throat> on the far right edge of this, or left edge of it, whichever way it might be pointing for you, you know, there's this 
shoot up, exponential shoot up of all of these. Um, and that pertains to our little space in history right now. Uh, which kind of shows you where we're at and where we're heading very soon. Indeed, temperatures look set to go well beyond any of the peaks in the Milankovitch cycles over the past 400,000 years. If average temperatures were to rise by some 8.1 C, they would reach a level virtually unprecedented in the entire history of the Earth. Um, how much warming have emissions by people caused between pre-industrial and 2016? Uh, the default, NASA's default baseline was, is, you know, between 1951 and 1980, the temperature was, uh, so that baseline was 14 point, 14 C straight up, I guess. In 1900, it was 13.72 C. In 1750, it was 13.42 C. So that's a 0.58 C rise from 1750 to the baseline of 1951 and 1980. Uh, yeah, 0.58 C. Now, there, there was a global rise from the base. So NASA's baseline, and I guess this is what we're getting over and over, guys, is this statement that temperatures have risen 1 C. Um, globally, right? And this is, seems to be reiterated over and over again that we've reached a 1C temperature rise. This is where we're at. But I, I am guessing or assuming this is correct that they were using the 1951 and 1980 NASA baseline. So from 1951 to 1980, the rise is 1C. If you add the 0.58C from 1750, we are past 1.5. <clears throat> Uh, so, of course, it's very convenient to use that 1951 to 1980 baseline. Uh, so, there you go. It, here's an alternate way to calculate the global annual temperature rise from 1750. Um in 1966, the temperature was 14 C. In, in 2016, it was about 15 C. Um, they're going to go through this basically the same math again. So, according to the Arctic News, according to the Arctic News, or according to this particular post in the Arctic News, they're saying 1.58 C. Again, if we reach 2C in the next you know, year or two or even in the next couple months, do you think anybody would tell us? Do you, do you think the powers that be would let us in on the fact that we reached 2C? I don't know. Or maybe, maybe not. Maybe, the, you know, maybe they will report it factually. Yeah. Um, Deacon, I don't know where the, I, there wasn't a date on the page and that's why I was kind of confused about where it was and why it looks so strange in my browser. But I think that's an older post, like much older, like a couple of years ago, uh, like probably four years ago. So maybe that's why you can't find it. <clears throat> Um, sorry, my, my, my browser just seems to be glitching out and I don't, it's hard for me to see your chats. Exactly. Basil Peterson changing baselines makes anything possible, right? Um, yeah. Jacob Gordon says, all this temperature rise is with ice at the top of the planet. What happens when that ice goes? Yeah, what happens when that ice goes? Uh, 
Well, and Elsie, I agree with you. I, I'm sure you're referencing Guy McPherson. <clears throat> Elsie says, I'm skeptical, skeptical of his predictions, as anyone should be, but his evidence is peer-reviewed references. I mean, he's pretty much just collating or, or, or combining the evidence and presenting it as if you take all the evidence and you put it together, this is what it looks like. And that's his, that's his, uh, I guess, you know, review of the evidence at hand and summation. Oh, Rich Diana, I only go to Arctic news blog when I'm not feeling suicidal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing about, um, you know, Arctic news, I, you know, when I read the Arctic news or look at the Arctic news, I, I categorize it as this is the you know, worst case scenario news, news spot for climate change. So do I think that they're wrong? I don't know. I just take it as one of many possibilities. I, you know, I, I like the evidence they present. I see what they're saying and I, you know, I get it, but I, I feel like the Arctic news is, you know, is pretty much the mouthpiece of the worst possible case scenario, you know, whatever that might, whoever might hold that opinion. And, you know, there are, there are other opinions on the spectrum, right? Right, Book Hermit? <laughs> there are other opinions on the spectrum of where we're at. Um, and, you know, you don't have to agree with them. You can take them all in and do your own uh, presumptions or assumptions or review of the material and come to your own conclusions. Right. Yeah, I, I, I can't see any other information on the post, Deacon. I, I apologize. I wish I could give you more info. Use the 1980 baseline? Why, Book Hermit? I don't really understand. That's, you know, if you want to feel better, just use the 1980 baseline. <laughs> If you want to feel like we're not in a really bad place, then, you know, just move the goalposts, right? Um, you understand that that's what people with cluster B disorders do. They move the goalposts, right? They change the inputs in order to, you know, to get the desired uh, conclusion, Anyways, let's move on. Uh, maybe I'll close some of these and this will help my experience a little more. I don't know. We've already looked at some of these. Maybe Twitter is the culprit. I feel like Twitter is bad. Bad. Oh, this is um, good news. You know, in the, in the middle of all the craziness and in, in the middle of the badness, I feel like there are some glimmers of hope out there around you know, glimmers of maybe not hope, but at least, um, I don't know, some, some kind of break towards people who care about the climate. But Dakota Access Oil Line to be shut by court in blow for Trump. This is from to, today. Uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline must shut down by August 5th. Remember, they, they halted construction on the pipeline and I, I think just suspended some activity on the pi pipeline maybe it was a month ago because of a court ruling uh, around the environmental impacts that were done before the pipeline was the construction was started anyways they're telling they're saying we, you got to shut it down the decision which shuts the pipeline during a court ordered environmental review and that's what this is tied to that's expected to extend into 2021 is a momentous win for American Indian tribes that have opposed the energy transfer LP project for years. It comes just a day after Dominion Energy Inc., it's a hilarious name, and Duke Energy Corporation scuttled another project, the Atlantic Coast Natural Gas Pipeline, after years of legal delays. Environmentalists have increasingly used the courts to try to block additional investment in fossil fuel infrastructure infrastructure while they push for a clean energy transition. Tribes, landowners, and other project opponents have also complained 
about local impacts from construction and potential spills on or near their lands. The sophisticated legal onslaught has led to delays and disruptions for numerous other proposed and operational pipelines, including Keystone XL. I, yes. That's the one I believe I was referring to just a minute ago, but Monday's court order, if upheld on appeal, marks the first time a major in-service oil pipeline will be forced to shutter because the envir- of environmental concerns. Uh, all right. All right. This is good news. The oil industries are already you know, teetering, are in a very precarious position <clears throat> financially. Uh, this is great. Um, yes, Jacob Gordon says, I'm sorry, a little too late. Yeah, uh, you know, it's kind of like these little tiny wins that we get against the onslaught of industrial civilization. You know, they they feel good for a second and then you realize how much more needs to be changed on, on a massive scale. And <clears throat> that's when you realize like, Okay, that's something, but, you know, we need a whole lot more than that. Um, But, yeah, you know, it's something. Hold on. Waiting for my browser to come back. Hold on. Okay, let's move on. move on to this story from Miami. Hold on. Hold on. Here we go. <clears throat> Miami broke its all-time heat record for June, but no warnings were issued. Here's why. This is from yesterday. And you're looking at a map of, you know, high heat coming at us or being experienced right now. Anyways, on Tuesday, the temperature at Miami International Airport reached 98 degrees Fahrenheit, making it the hottest day on record for the month of June. So they, this year, <laughs> a temperature record was set in Miami. This, this year, this is not an anomaly. Again, this is a, this follows in line with a trend of higher temperatures over, you know, the last few decades, but, you know, especially over the last five years. Yet no heat advisories or excessive heat warnings were issued on the same day. A high temperature of 91 degrees was recorded in Topeka, Kansas, and a heat advisory was issued. What happened? Is it 98 degrees hotter than 91 degrees? Yes, but every National Weather Service office has different criteria for heat advisories and excessive heat warnings. Yeah, so basically, if there's, you know, the factors of humidity and all kinds of different things. But here's, here's what's really important. And I, I, I used to bring this up uh, a, lot, uh, a lot more maybe a year or two ago. But the way that they measure the temperature is, is always very interesting to me. Um, I understand it's, you know, scientifically based and, you know, there's the, the method of temperature gauge was developed over many, many years, but when they tell you what the temperature is going to be, they mean, you know, in the shade, a few feet off the ground, right? So if you're in the sun or if you're close to the ground, especially if you're close to the ground in the sun, it can be 15 to 20 degrees hotter. So, you know. If they say, oh, it's going to be 98 degrees today, but if you're actually in the sun anywhere, it's, it's actually more like 115 degrees. Um, and that is a huge difference, you know, 115 degrees and 98 degrees, huge difference. Anyways, in order to receive a heat advisory, Miami must have a heat index value of 108 degrees or higher for the last two hours for at least two hours for an excessive heat warning. The heat index needs to reach 113 degrees. Um, anyway, so apparently it didn't reach the, the degree for kicking in a 
heat warning. But this is what I wanted to read to you. The heat index is a measurement of how hot it feels to your body when the factor when you factor in both relative humidity and the actual air temperature. One limiting factor, however, this is very important, and this actually this actually supports my argument. You know, I used to go back and forth with people maybe a year ago about how how temperatures were recorded and the actual temperature that was experienced by you know living beings on the planet, right? One limiting factor, however, is that the heat index is calculated in shaded locations, not direct sun sunlight, which can feel as much as 15 degrees warmer. Uh, so that's not included in the heat index. So like, yeah, if you are not sitting in the shade in a hammock, you know, three feet above the ground, <clears throat> where everything's fine if it's 98 degrees, but if you get off that hammock and go walk into the sunshine, well, you're going to get boiled alive. <clears throat> um, anyways, so I wanted to read this to you as well, because this is very pertinent. Miami hasn't had just one hot day this year. Again, this is not an anomaly. <clears throat> this is absolutely a trend, a trend that speaks of global warming and climate change kicking in. It's, uh, <clears throat> Miami has had weeks and weeks of intense heat. In fact, seven of the 10 hottest weeks on record have occurred this year. <laughs> so seven, they, they've broken the record for hottest weeks, seven out of 10 times. Miami's high temperatures do not peak traditionally until the beginning of August. Youch. So it's, you know, we're going to assume that it's going to get much hotter in Miami over the next month or two. Uh, so anyways, they're talking mo mostly about heat advisory criteria. But what they're also talking about is there, that there has been excessive heat pretty much all over the country. Um, lots of heat records have been broken. <clears throat> and, the, you know, the way that they measure the temperature <laughs> uh, is actually very misleading about how hot it, it actually feels to people. And I, I have a problem with that. I have a serious problem. Again, this is one of the ways of negating in people's minds, like how hot it really, you know, when people are, you look at their temperature app in their phone, oh, it's, you know, it says 88 degrees. But if you know how that 88 degrees was measured, what you're feeling, what you're actually feeling in the sunshine is probably something more like 95 or even hotter. So I... You know, I find these measurements to be misleading at best. And all, you know, of course, all of the measurements um, skew towards lower temperatures, right? So if you, if you only acknowledge these temperatures that are taken in the shade, um, you know, then it's easy to kind of, you know, say like, we're, well, we're, it's not that hot. It's not out of the bounds of... Uh, normality or whatever. Um, boiled rope lamppost seems like shade is necessary for the proper operations of the device. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they have their reasons for why they do these measurements. But the thing is, is that the heat index, the whole heat index thing was developed because obviously these temperatures didn't, line up at all with how it actually felt, right? So they, just like they do a, a <clears throat> wind chill factor in the winter, <clears throat> you know, they do a feels like. So yeah, the temperature is going to be 88 degrees today, but feels like 95 or 96 or 97. <clears throat> it's very important <laughs> to people what it actually feels like um, when you're going about your day, especially if you're working outside. <clears throat> or going to do some activities outside. Uh, you know, Deacon says, hold on, I'm getting a lot of, ah, arg. 
Deacon says it's 101 with the heat index right now. Right. There you go. 101 right now. Uh, Judy Truitt, the scientific method. God dang it. Um, sorry, my this is really annoying. I don't know why this is happening. Judy Truitt says the scientific method does not consider the observer effect, which exists according to quantum physics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hmm. In Florida, at least three octogenarians have, have to die before a warning is issued, says Basil Peterson. Joking, of course. But again, this is, you know, this is kind of being used, I think, on some level to downplay how, how hot it really is or how, how hot it's really been getting. And again, you know, if they're saying, well, the temperature today is, you know, 101 or 102, but, they, you know, if you're in the sun, it feels like 120. You know, that's, that's the time when it actually really gets life-threatening. Osama says 91 degrees here, 52% relative humidity. Feels like the temperature is 98. Well, yeah, and I've been where you are, Osama, when it's in the 90s like that. It is brutal because the, generally the humidity is... I mean, 58% is not as high as it could be. Right. Poppy Davis, the temperature should be reported as in the shade, in the sun, and heat index. Yes. <clears throat> I agree with you. <clears throat> I totally agree with you. Right. There's a, so there's a, uh, there's a thermo, like a temperature reading like on top of a bank down the street from my house. And so my app will say, oh, it's 92 degrees today. But when I go past that bank, they're, they're measuring in the sun. Because when I go past the bank, it's like 10, it's always 10 degrees like higher than my app says. Um, and that's the one I go by. Like this, this is actually how it feels, right? This is the temperature, how it actually feels. Um, so yeah, I think it would actually be more useful and helpful to people if you told them what the temperature is in the sun. <laughs> what does it feel like? Look, it's going to be 115 in the sun today. You think people are going to act much differently than if you told them 98 or 100? Uh, I think people would be a lot more cautious. <clears throat> Anyways. Anyways, let's move on. I know I talked a lot about that. And lastly... This is a heat wave. Heat wave to bake most of the U.S. This is from yesterday. And again, see they're reporting feels like temps. Feels like. 199, 109, 92, 98, 90. 109 in Marathon, Florida. Holy shnikes. A sweltering summer heat wave will grip an unusually vast swath of the nation this week, 270 million people, that's 84% of the continental U.S. population, will see highs above 90 degrees at least one day this week. And for most, it will be multiple days. Uh, at one time or another, about 150 million people will sweat through heat index numbers of 100 degrees. While the heat wave will be expansive, it will not be very intense, at least at the beginning of the week. However, as the week wears on, the heat dome will heat dome will recenter and intensify, bringing widespread heat index numbers of 105 to 115. For the first half of the week, the core of the heat will be centered over the Great Lakes, Ohio Valley, and Mid Atlantic, with high temperatures in the low to mid 90s for cities like Detroit, Indianapolis, and Washington D.C. When you factor in humidity, feels like temperatures will top out near 100. <clears throat> the daytime heat will certainly be high but not many records will fall. This will last through at least Friday. Meanwhile, 
The western extent of this heat wave over the lower Plains states and lower Mississippi Valley will become dominant and build later in the week into the weekend. Although it's still several days away in these areas, the heat wave may become quite severe. Interesting evolution to this heat wave this week. Initially, the heat core is over the Great Lakes, but then a subtropical high builds west and north, merging with the building heat dome over the deep southwest lower plains. Late week weekend, get ready for intense heat nation's middle. That's Jeff Baradelli. By Thursday afternoon, heat, heat index values will begin to top out, top out around 105 from Kansas southward to Texas and east through Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana, and will only get more intense from there. On Saturday, heat index values across Oklahoma City, Dallas, and Little Rock may approach 100 to 115 degrees. Widespread 105 to 115 heat index numbers seem likely, especially in Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, there's some disagreement in the models on how expansive and how intense the Plains and Mississippi Valley heat wave will be later this week and into the weekend. <clears throat> the intensity of the oppressive heat may last a full week or even longer. The National Weather Service points to a long-lasting hot and dry spell across much of the nation for the next eight to 14 days, so possibly two weeks long of this especially across the Southwest and Plains states. Hey guys, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. You can also support the channel at the links below, PayPal, Square, and Patreon. Also, um, all of my live streams are available for listening on Patreon if you happen to miss them during the day. So um, you can sign up for my Patreon for as little as a dollar. If you want to go check out the live streams, they are all there. Thanks a lot.